Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to today's briefing entitled Pension Risk and Your Retirement. The panelists today are Ethan Craw and Lane West. My name is Bill Rapp. I'm with the American Academy of Actuaries. We expect the uh, presentation part of today's briefing to last about one hour to be followed by about 30 minutes of Q&A. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Academy is a 17,000 member professional organization whose mission is to serve the public on behalf of the actuarial profession. So with that, I will turn it over to Lane and Ethan and uh, enjoy the briefing. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Our topic for today is the subject of, of financial risk for individuals in retirement, uh, for both plan sponsors, for individuals, and for society. And also, we're going to spend some time on talking about what the government might do to alleviate some of those risks. Uh, we're going to start with an overview of pension plans and also talk about current coverages, uh, general trends. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the different retirement risks. And we're defining that as not having enough retirement income. Uh, one definition is your take-home pay after retirement should be equal to your take-home pay before retirement. And so we're using that as the, uh, as the standard. We'll spend some time talking about pooled risk versus individual risk. And then we're going to talk about some possible policy options, changes that can be made to uh, enhance retirement security. There are generally two types of retirement plans, defined benefit and defined contribution. The defined benefit plans, the, most of those plans are traditional annuity-based plans. For an example, if you had a plan that would pay 50% of pay upon retirement for the rest of your life, that's a defined benefit plan with an annuity-based formula. Um, defined contribution plan, of course, is the most common type of retirement plan that we have today. And we're not going to focus so much today on the types of retirement plans, but we're going to focus on the risk in retirement from those plans and how individuals can achieve a uh, reasonable retirement income. Uh, one thing you've seen in the last uh, 10 to 15 years is what we call, what we call hybrid plans. Um, a hybrid plan is a plan that uh, <coughs> has some of the characteristics of a defined benefit plan and a defined contribution plan. And those are plans that have been introduced by a number of major companies. The last survey I saw said that 22 of the Fortune 100 had hybrid plans as their, as their uh, retirement program. Um, they're considered defined benefit plans under U.S. law, but that's not necessarily the case in other countries. So a hybrid plan is a combination of defined benefit and defined contribution. This chart shows you how the plans work. You'll see there's a, there's a lot in common between the two types of plans. Uh, they each have a, a fund. The fund receives the contributions. The fund's invested and earns investment income. So regardless of the type of plan you have, there's a fund that you're accumulating assets in, and then um, that fund pays benefits. So there's a lot of commonality between defined benefit and defined contribution. The ultimate goal of both of those plans is what? To provide an adequate stream of retirement income whether it's defined benefit, defined contribution, or a combination of the two. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. Um, I want to go spend a few minutes covering current trends. The, uh, you'll see there, there are two items. Uh, there are three columns here. These are for individuals that are employed by private enterprises. You might think of these as non-governmental uh, employers. You see the covered by any plan. Uh, in the 80s, it was around 80 percent. One survey uh, showed 91 percent in, in 1985. You'll see that that's decreased over time. Now, one reason that's decreased, it's down to 68 percent now. And that's, a, that's what I would call an, a, an alarming trend uh, from that standpoint. Um, this does not include, you might want to make a note of this, this does not include 401k plans where there's no employer money. In other words, this, these are plans where the employer is contributing to the plan, either through a match or a basic contribution. Uh, you all know that defined benefit plans have been, in, in, uh, have been being reduced. The coverage is reduced. This particular survey said in 2009 that 32% of private enterprise employees were covered by a defined benefit plan and 55% 
uh, were covered by a defined contribution plan. You'll see these numbers total to more than 68. That's because some people are covered by, by both types of plans. Spent a few minutes talking about uh, the defined benefit plans and what's been happening with those plans. Uh, private, I've, I've got two columns here. I've got private plans and I've got governmental and state and local plans. I just wanted to show that for contrast. Our focus today is primarily on the private plans. Uh, those that have earned or, or have earned a defined benefit in this particular survey, you'll notice here it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics in March of 2009. Uh, they found that 20% of the individuals employed by private uh, enterprises had or were accruing or had accrued benefits in defined benefit plan. You'll see that compares to state and local government plans, which is 79%. So there's a lot more defined benefit plans in, in the governmental arena. Um, the thing we wanted to talk about here was the number of frozen versus open plans. Uh, of the 20%, of the 20 percent, 19 percent are frozen plans and 81 percent are open. That means open and people are continuing to earn benefits. Now, we all, the actuaries in the room know uh, that that's, that trend has continued to decrease and there's a substantial number of open plans that are now closed. I know from my own experience, um, almost all of my defined benefit plans that I work on have been closed to new entrants. Um, and some have been hard frozen. So I think this figure, if you take into account 2008, 2009 through 2011, you'll see a decrease in that. Again, this data is, was as of March 2009. Well, of frozen plans, there are three types. There's the soft freeze and the hard freeze and then in between. Now, let me just explain what that is. A hard freeze is where there are no new employees coming into the plan and where uh, the benefits have been frozen. So an individual who's earned, say, a $200 a month pension, they're age 40, will not earn any more pension. The soft freeze, or what I like to call a, an, a closed plan, the individuals that are in the plan continue to earn a benefit, but individuals that are not in the, uh, not in the plan don't enter. So there are no new entrants in a, in a soft freeze situation. Um, for example, a, example of, of the fact that this has been decreasing, uh, General Electric announced a couple of months ago that they were closing their plan, that they're doing a soft freeze. So. Um, the, this trend has continued. You'll notice in governmental, um, only about 1% are hard frozen. Um, and with the statistics, if you look down into the details of those websites, you'll find that most of those were frozen more than six years ago. In, in the private sector, most of these plans were frozen in the last six years, whereas in the government, most were frozen in the past. Why is this only 1% in the governmental arena? Um, courts have interpreted state constitutions to say that once an employee, once someone's employed, uh, you cannot take away the future benefits. You cannot change their plan. And so that's the case in, in some states. I know I do some work in, uh, in Georgia, and it really depends on the language in the plan. If the plan allowed changes in its language, then they can make the changes. But if the plan did not say that, they cannot amend the plan to cut off benefits for people that are already, already working. So that's, the, that's the, uh, the difference. A soft freeze is when the plan is closed to new entrants, but people that are in the plan continue to earn benefits. A hard freeze is when the benefits are totally frozen. And we've seen a lot of people shift to the soft freeze. Um, I know clients of mine that have gone to soft freeze, usually within five years, five or six years, they go to the hard freeze. And there are various reasons for that, but that's just a step uh, toward uh, getting out of those plans. So how much retirement income do you need? Studies have shown that the ratio, your ratio of, of gross earnings, uh, your post-retirement income versus your pre-retirement income needs to be between 70 and 100 percent. And I generally use the figure of 80 to 85 percent. If you can retire with gross income 80 to 85 percent of what you were making before you retire, you can have the same standard of living. Now, why is, why is it not 100 percent? Number one, you're not paying FICA taxes. FICA tax is 7.65%, so you're not paying that. Typically, unless you're very wealthy, you're not saving anymore. You're going from a saver to a dissaver. So if you're saving 10% of pay, then you're not saving that anymore, so you don't need that income. And that, because your income is lower, your federal income tax rates would be lower. So those are some of the reasons that it's not, not 100%. Now, why might it be 100%? In this parentheses here, we, we say depending on inclusion 
or not of retiree medical and cost of living adjustments. If your employer has a defined benefit plan that provides cost of living increases, and very few do, um, then that allows you to move more toward the 70 percent. If your um, employer provides retiree medical benefits which are fully subsidized by the employer, and that's not very common, uh, then you can move toward the 70 percent. But if you have to, have to provide your own retiree medical and your own cost of living increases, you move more toward the 100 percent. In addition, um, and this does include all sources of income, Social Security, uh, employer plans and personal savings. And one of the other keys in retirement, the other key need is inflation protection. Right now inflation is low, but we know that there are times when inflation is high. Uh, that has a big impact on the retirement income of, of someone's on fixed income. Inflation has a tremendous negative effect on that. Uh, one advantage of Social Security is it does provide an automatic cost of living increase. So that helps at least the lower paid individuals uh, to keep up uh, with inflation. At this time I'm going to turn it over to Ethan who's going to talk more about the retirement risk. Thank you, Lane. So how many are at risk of inadequate retirement income? Uh, this slide shows you some data from uh, Alicia Minnell up in Boston College. Uh, comparing just even two very recent years, 2007-2009. Over the past few years, retirement income security has declined amongst all age brackets. Primary reasons are the decline in the DB, DB system through plan freezes or eliminations that Lane talked about. The biggest retirement risk is not having enough income. And the Center for Re Retirement Research at Boston College estimated the portions of different generations that are at risk of not having enough retirement income. The early boomers are in best shape. Many were covered by generous DB plans. Many appreciated, had the appreciation in the value of their homes. They bought them earlier and some of them did not refinance. The late bloomers are worse off, likely due to lower pensions and a volatile stock market. And the younger generations are just going to have to save more for retirement and be more reliant on themselves. Amongst all groups, Large numbers of employees, just frankly, are not saving enough money. So what are some of the retirement risks that we face? Well, how do you find retirement in success? They you have enough money to live on, to maintain your standard of living into retirement. Uh, financial retirement risks include insufficient resources and also the volatility. And we'll come to that volatility with a few examples, a few slides from now. Uh, you've got investment longevity. In people live longer. Most people underestimate their life expectancy. You ask the average 65 year old how long they expect to live, typical answer is about 10 years. The actuarial tables, about 20. In fact, if you have a husband and wife, white collar, age 65, the odds are one in four that one of them will live to 95. One in ten that one of them will celebrate the hundredth into the hundredth year of life. Most are not planning for that. 